Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome again uh, to follow one of our webinars that we've been we've been holding during the uh, pandemic time. And uh, my name is Juha Imbivara. I work in Ledal as a territory manager. And today, uh, as you can see, we are not not in the office as as before, or but this time we are in Kuopio, and more specific, we are in Kuopio. Uh, University Hospital and ICU. So intensive care unit is the is the place for for today's today's uh, webinar. And as you can see in the in the video, I'm I'm not alone here. So with me, I have a uh, our clinical clinical specialist Kirsi Maria Metsvainio here as well. So Kirsi Maria, please you please uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Thank you, Juho. Hello, everybody. My name is Kirsi Maria Metsavainio. I'm an anesthesiologist, and I work as a clinical educator or a, a person who is uh, responsible for our simulation education in the Kuopio University Hospital in the Center of Clinical Education. And uh, today, uh, we are very happy to present you a, a case scenario uh, from our intensive care unit education program uh, for a respiratory distress patient. Our Coop University Hospital is uh, one of five university hospitals in Finland. Uh, we are in the eastern part of Finland in the uh, Kuopio uh, city area. And uh, we have about 600 beds and uh, the area around our own hospital uh, is about 200 thousand people and the whole area of our uh, which we are responsible is about 700,000 inhabitants. So we have a personnel of 4,000, uh, mainly nurses uh, and uh, about 800 uh, doctors and uh, here in our intensive care unit we have uh, 14 uh, rooms and uh, around 30 beds. And the staff has about 120 nurses and uh, the doctors who are uh, doing on call here in the ICU are around 30. So we have about 150 uh, persons to uh, educate for, uh, for a simulation education. And, uh, and we have had uh, quite many programs for them. Uh, like uh, the first hour for the intensive care patient, the, uh, child patient uh, in the extubation and intubation protocols. And also, uh, which is very interesting because we have a cardiac heart surgery center here in Corpio, we have doing a re-sternotomy training, uh, emergency re-sternotomy training for our personnel within which we use a, a library mannequin, which has been opened and uh, modified to make a re-sternotomy the patient. So we have quite nice setup of uh, uh, simulations, but uh, we could use more. And now we are planning to do uh, simulations which uh, concentrate on the uh, uh, neurological failures, uh, respiratory failure, and also circulatory failure, and uh, doing th that kind of thing. And this is one of our respiratory failure cases, scenarios, which we are now presenting to you with Juho. Thank you, Kirsi Maria. And before we go that, uh, as, is, as it says in the topic, our today's uh, topic is plan, execute, advance respiratory care simulations. And we will talk about that. And Kirsi Maria will tell us uh, about a bit about the planning and, and the executing, of course, as well. But before we go uh, into that, could you please describe uh, what kind of facilities for simulation training you have here? Since all the audience can see, we are in the patient room now. But uh, what kind of other simulating faci facilities you have here in in Kuopio? Well, um, we were the first uh, Finnish university hospital to get its own simulation center. Uh, it's in the downstairs in this uh, quite new building, which was built uh, 2015, and uh, we have two simulation rooms there with a uh, connecting. Uh, uh, machine room or, or operating room and uh, three lecture rooms. Uh, it's quite small, but uh, it is sufficient. Uh, 
for our needs, but we are doing a lot, a lot uh, in situ simulation. So we try to bring the simulation to the real place, like in here in the ICU, or in the emergency room, or in the, uh, uh, for example, in the operating theater. So. Uh, it is the best to train professionals, in my opinion, to do the simulations in C2, because there, there as you can see, the equipment, uh, all the uh, uh, medications that we have in, in the background, which you don't see, there's the medication, automatic medication cabin, which should be used uh, by nurses and other things. It's so, it is familiar, and, uh, and uh, the solutions uh, which Lairdal has been uh, producing like uh, advanced mannequins like Simman, which can be put uh, onto the ventilator and which can be intubated and now it is on a, in our servo uh, eye uh, ventilator all the time and also we can have uh, been able to put the uh, the Lairdal patient monitor to the, our normal retro monitor uh, with the screen share, so you can the nurses and doctors can look just right where they usually look. Okay, it's not doesn't look like like a uh, normal monitor, but uh, we have also tried the uh, large solution called Vital Bridge, and um, it has been working very well in our cardiac care unit, and uh, uh, and then there in that you can put a real. Um, a monitor with uh, simulated parameters and that works quite quite nicely and helps the personnel to uh, get uh, the feeling of real situation uh, during the simulation. When evaluating the results of the simulation training, how important do you see that we can use the real equipment in this case and, and the real environment that we are now? It is, uh, I, I think it's very important uh, because the um, the ability, the immersion, it's called immersive uh, immersion uh, into the simulation. Uh, it is, gets better with the real equipment and real uh, environment. So uh, the problem with adults is usually they think we are playing with mannequins. No, we are trying to uh, simulate uh, the reality, the, the real things that they do in the real life. And uh, when we are in the real environment, it's, it's much better that way. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we are ready to move forward mm -hmm. to, to our patient case. But before that, uh, behind me, maybe you can see I have an iPad here for that reason that I will, I will uh, see your uh, comments and answers. So what will we do next that we will start uh, going through our, our case that gives him what it will, will it go through in a, in a couple of minutes. But please, when we when we ask questions, what would we, what would we do next, or what would you do next? Please write your comments to the to the chat box, and then we can see your answers from there, and and maybe continue the simulations towards the way that that you you wanted to go. Uh, but yeah, so any comments, any questions, please write them in the chat, and and we will go go through them. And also this this whole whole webinar is, is recorded, so you will be able to uh, see this afterwards and, and share it to your colleagues if, if they're not around today. But yeah, uh, would you please uh, explain a little bit the uh, case and, and, uh, and, the, setup. and the setup that yeah. we, are, we are now having here? Sure. Okay, the, we have this case. Uh, patient has a resp adult respiratory distress syndrome, so a very uh, no moderate or difficult uh, oxygenation problem. Uh, the case scenario goes like the, this is a 58 uh, years old male person. He has a very difficult bacterial pneumonia and ARDS. He has been on ventilator for five days. His weight is uh, 87 kilograms and the height is uh, 181 centimeters. He's intubated and he's on the volume control uh, synchronized uh, mandatory ventilation. I don't know, is that uh, very well seen? 
because of the mannequin uh, is an electrical equipment, we are not able to put the uh, uh, FiO2 as we like, so it, it goes to 21%. Uh, and also the PEEP is a little bit lower than it uh, should be. Uh, in the beginning, this uh, patient has tidal volume of 510 milliliters. The frequency is 20 uh, per minute. And the uh, end expiratory pressure is uh, eight centimeters water. And the, the fraction of inspired oxygen, FiO2, is uh, 0 0.5, it's 50%. The patient is quite hemodynamically stable. Uh, Although he has a noradrenaline infusion, eight milliliters per hour, uh, he has a basic fluid going on, 200 milliliters per day, perhaps. And he's on antibiotic treatment with piperacillin, tatsubactam, and uh, he has a septic shock hydrocortisone going on, uh, which we use 50 milligrams uh, four times per day. For sedation, he has a propofol infusion. Now it goes 10 milliliters per hour. And the uh, nurses use bolus fentanyl. And uh, sometimes if, if the, they need rescue medication, uh, they use midazolam and rocuronium as a muscle relaxant. In the beginning, the patient is stable. He's intubated. The tube depth is 23 centimeters. The oxygen saturation is about uh, 88, 89. Not very good, but uh, it is uh, the uh, required minimum. We are very happy with this uh, situation. And uh, uh, the compliance, uh, the lung compliance is around 30, 30, 30 about, and the blood pressure is one of about 100. Uh, over 50 and the uh, patient is in the sinus rhythm and there is a, a rate of, uh, of frequency of 115 beats per minute. Patient is sedated with propofol and fentanyl boluses and uh, it starts to wear off and uh, the patient starts to breathe more spontaneously. So he wakes a little bit up. So. Let's see what happens. I don't know if you can see yeah. the monitor really, really well. Yeah, the patient starts breathing and uh, maybe moving a little bit his head, like here. And uh, the problem is that the saturation drops to 81 to 82. So question is for the uh, participants or you in the behind the camera. So what would you do? Would you rise uh, FiO2, one? Would you rise uh, tidal volume, and how much? Uh, would you change frequency, rise or get it lower? Uh, would you give a fentanyl? Would you give a midazolam? And would you give rocuronium? And which uh, amount of fentanyl, midazolam, and rocuronium would you give? Now you have a, a minute or two to answer these questions. So, <clears throat> and I will say them again. So, would you change FiO2, the inspired oxygen? Would you change tidal volume? Uh, would you change frequency? Would you give any medication, fentanyl, midazolam, rocuronium? And how much would you give? This is like some kind of, um, not a competition, but a quiz for you. Yeah, so please go ahead, write your answer to the, to the chat and, and we can continue after, after that. We will continue anyway, so don't, don't worry. <laughs> it, we won't stop here un <laughs> unless we don't get any answers, but in our simulation scenario, the participants uh, are uh, seeing this situation. They have they have to adjust. They have to adjust the treatment of the patient according to the situation. So they have to uh, um, respond to the problem. Are there any 
Not yet. Suggestions. What would she? What would you do? Okay. Okay. I think we're ready to move on. Okay. So first thing. Hey, wait. Well, let's first let's thing wait I, a bit. We yeah. we got our yeah first brave here, and uh, she's saying that chains F I O two. Okay. But happy that I'm not treating the patient since I'm not specialist. Just, just one a curious uh, attender who is who is uh, joined to our webinar. Okay, I will change uh, the FiO2 was uh, you in the beginning it was a zero point. It was fifty percent, fifty percent. So uh, I would change it to maybe to sixty or seventy percent from here. And because the patient is breathing, he's, uh, he's uh, doing a lot of uh, breathing work, he's uh, restless, I would give him sedation, fentanyl, 50 micrograms in, from the beginning, maybe midazolam, one milligram, and see what uh, effect that has. Does it uh, calm down? And with these medications and the uh, FiO2 rise up, the patient <coughs> calms down. The spontaneous breathing goes away. He also is also he's again very calm. But we have a problem with oxygenation. The saturation is not going up. So what's the problem? We ask from our participants. What is the problem? What? Why is the oxygen going down? And now we can have a discussion about oxygenation problems, like uh, the uh, the shunt which is behind all of this. So what what is the reason of the oxygenation problem? And what would you, what would you do if you have this kind of problem? Uh, uh, it is important uh, always check if the delivery system is okay. Is the tube on the place? Is the cuff uh, filled or, or the cuff pressure is it we are measuring cuff pressure continuously uh, not in this uh, simulation but usually on the normal patient so if it's okay uh, is there any problems somewhere else and then uh, the first thing to go after the sedation is uh, okay uh, would be to um, uh, change the ventilator settings so how would you do, what would you do next? Would you change tidal volume? Would you change frequency? Uh, would you change uh, positive and expiratory pressure, PEEP? Uh, and uh, how much? And uh, remember, we are on the volume control. We are on the volume control mode uh, with the uh, SI, SMF, uh, sim uh, so spontaneous mandatory ventilation and uh, the peak pressure is going up to 35 now in our simulation so also the plateau pressure is getting very high and you might remember that uh, the uh, the recommended plateau pressure should be around 28 or not uh, exceed 30. yeah there's uh, a couple of yeah, a couple of comments. Uh, and also give some midachalam. Yeah. Uh, so that was probably for yeah. the for the first question, which is correct. Uh, and then there's a question: how much how much is the peep now? The peep in the patient is right now it's eight. How many fingers? Eight. So would you would what would you change in the ventilator settings? In our ICU, the nurses are doing lots of uh, adjustment of ventilators, and uh, and uh, they are. Uh, but this kind of situation, they might ask the doctor, and we have uh, lots of young residents who are very familiar uh, in the operating theater, but not so familiar with the ICU patients. Uh, should we go through at this point that what we have, have what have we done so far? Yeah. So basically the situation from the beginning uh it hasn't changed a much the saturation it's, it's got going low yeah low still and uh 
What's the clinical status of the patient now? Blood pressure is also a little bit lower, but we gave him sedation, yeah. propofol, midazolam, fentanyl, and so on. What is important is to check for the participants, to check the clinical status for the breathing. So do, do always your A, B, C, Ds. That is very important because uh, the clinical examination and the lung auscultation is a very important part of the uh, uh, taking care of the respiratory distress patients. So uh, you can hear if there are new atelectasis or if there might be a pneumothorax. And also an ultrasound uh, on the bedside is important to do rehearse so that young resident, young, young doctor, uh, can start and learn problem-solving uh, 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 skills. So what he should do, check the auscultation, maybe check the lung ultrasound and so on, and then change the settings of the ventilator. Yeah. So any uh, suggestions from the chat? Yeah, there's a question that what will happen if you increase uh, PPV? What is it? PPV. Mm, uh, what is um, not familiar with that? Yeah, could you please, uh, for pressure, there's a comment that it means yeah. pressure. Increase. We are not using Finland, that kind of... Um, Short shortening. sentences, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I might understand you if you said it in English. But you were mentioning about the APCD protocol during yeah. the during the treatment of the patient. So how, how often would you recommend to do that? Like uh, the frequencies of, of doing your APCD? How? Well, our nurses are doing this uh, one one time per hour, but uh, doctors usually once or uh, twice per or their shift, depending on. Yeah. I only say I only understand per PPV and positive pressure ventilation. So. I don't know. Sure. Uh, the first thing to use when the oxidation goes low, lower, is to increase the positive and expiratory pressure. So we open the alveoles. I would uh, increase the PEEP from A to 10 or 12, or maybe you shouldn't fix on the uh, um, even number. So maybe one or 11 or 13, whatever makes any difference there. Now, another thing is the tidal volume also. But we need to remember that when you when we are treating the respiratory distress patients, so the recommended tidal volume is six to eight milliliters per kilogram. So don't exceed that. But a, a small increase in tidal volume might recruit more lungs uh, for the uh, uh, delivery of oxygen oxygen to the patient. So we try to recruit the lung in the situation when the when the uh, uh, saturation falls down. Of, co of course, uh, to the clinical examination, we might use also the uh, arterial blood gas sample. And we have uh, any uh, answers or, or results for we can give the T part to participants, say, results from arterial blood gas if they like to check it out. And also a setup for x rays, uh, if they need to take a thorax x ray or like to take it, uh, we have uh, prepared for the simulation uh, a setup for, for thorax x rays. And of course, we have a, a CT scan for the, in the beginning. Uh, how does the lung look like? Yeah, we have a comment that could answer for unclear questions. So thank you, Kirsi Maria, for that. Okay, what what would be the next step? Next step. Uh, okay, treating, we increase a little bit of a uh, tidal volume, maybe um, maximum fifty milliliters. It depends. How do you like to do it? How do you look at small steps? Uh, I recommend. The, the, the more critical patient, the smaller the steps. So don't make big moves. Make a small moves and check it, wait out what happens. Because when you increase the tidal volume and when you increase the PEEP, 
you affect the intrathoracal pressure. And when you affect intrathoracal pressure, you affect the heart because the heart-lung interaction is, uh, is, is of utmost importance. And the, and the heart and lung ultrasound uh, has evolved in last about 10 years uh, as a very important tool for ICU patients. And um, I would like, we don't have such a mannequin where you can do, do really do the ultrasound examination during the simulation, but I would like to have some, uh, that kind of mannequin that you can do and learn from the ultrasound results and to go on with that with the simulation. Well, next, uh, the problem is that um, when we have increased the PEEP and when we have increased the tidal volume, and maybe if we didn't give relaxation with rocuronium, muscle relaxant, we might think about it now when the saturation, it might fall even more lower, around less than 80, uh, if we should use uh, muscle relaxants and uh, try to really calm the patient down. As we know, the prolonged sedation and uh, muscle relaxation are uh, risk factors for uh, critical neuropathy, critical care neuropathy and uh, polyneuropathy. So it's very going up and down with these uh, choices and uh, decisions we make. But now we have a very high airway pressure. It goes uh, around 40 and the plateau pressure, which can be measured, uh, we use it with this uh, uh, servo and I think it's uh, available in other ventilators. Uh, any modern ICU ventilator, you can uh, measure the plateau pressure. It's now 32, so it's too high. The lungs are uh, distended. They are over distended and that might be a problem. Uh, they, it, uh, it hurts or, or uh, uh, makes more inflammation in those lungs. And the problem is that uh, you might have a barotrauma or a volutrauma to the lungs. So the treatment we give to patients is uh, uh, it's harming the lungs. Well, what, what, what should you do now there is a high plateau pressure, high peak pressure, um, and the oxygenation is still lagging around 80, 81. It's not, but not, not looking very nice. Uh, we, have a, we can still rise the fraction of uh, inspired oxygen. It is only now 80. And you can think about if you can uh, uh, rise it up to 100%, but then it's over. You can't give any more. Uh, should we try to reduce the tidal volume? And should we try to reduce uh, or rise actually the frequency, lower tidal volume, higher frequency? We still have to uh, eliminate the carbon dioxide from the patient. Uh, but uh, it has been uh, established that the so called permissive hypercapnia is not dangerous. The patient can adapt to higher carbon dioxide levels uh, if the rise is steady and slow. Well, we have been doing a volume control. How many of you would like to change suppressor control? Well, uh, is there any answers? Not yet, so please go yeah. ahead and use the chat again yeah. and uh, write your answer there and then we, we will see what happened next to the patient. Yeah. Would you like to change the ventilation? mode from volume control to pressure control and uh, we have also possibility to do uh, um, a pressure regulated volume control in this uh, servo ventilator yeah and the vitals at the moment are a heart rate uh, 112 uh, saturation uh, roughly 80 82 83. Uh, arterial pressure is uh, uh, 90, 92 over 40, 43. And the uh, carbonograph is uh, 4.5 at the moment. It might get a little bit up because of the 
the problem of uh, elimination of carbon dioxide. Yeah, and the respiratory rate is 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 20. Okay. I any think ideas? We, not yet. Any ideas? So lots of thinking going on behind the behind the camera, but well, go ahead. Well, uh, at least if we haven't been giving a muscle muscle relaxant like rocuronium, which we use, uh, you can use others, of course. Uh, I, I would give it right now now because we have a problem with the high peak pressure. Uh, we should uh, relax <coughs> the patient. He doesn't uh, resist the ventilation. And uh, I would change the ventilation mode to the pressure regulated volume control. Uh, it is important to participants uh, who are nurses and doctors in the ICU to understand the difference between these ventilation modes. It is very important that the volume control uh, delivers volume. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, you can be sure about the minute ventilation in the volume control. Tidal volume multiplied with frequency is uh, uh, what you get. With pressure control, you deliver pressure. And the tidal volume uh, depends on the lung, uh, uh, the quality of the lung tissue. So, and the uh, other, uh, the, and the quality of uh, uh, the respiratory problem. So the pressure is doesn't get up, so it doesn't hurt the lungs, but the tidal volume changes with time. So you have to be very uh, uh, careful that the uh, patient is not underventilated. So the tidal volume goes down, down, down. Frequency is the same, so the carbon dioxide gets up, up, up. So, but the pressure uh, regulated volume control is volume control, but which is pressure regulated. So there's volume and uh, there is a pressure limit. So it protects lungs maybe better. Uh, there are no uh, good evidence about which mode volume control or pressure control is better, but, but uh, it depends what you what you are uh, familiar with and uh, what you are used to do. So there are questions. Uh, yeah, this comment that we should change to uh, pressure yeah. volume control yeah. and, and relax the patient. Yeah, yeah, I agree totally. Yeah. Okay, should we do yeah. that? Yeah, we should do that. Tick ticks. We have. I have to change from here and put the settings very well, and that is what our participants would do themselves. With the with the mannequin and the ventilator, so they can fix it up the way they like to do. And then we could discuss about the uh, the settings and uh, how they would uh, uh, how the patient would react to this uh, situation. One question which I always ask from participants is that uh, should we turn the patient into the prone position? Now this we are not so this patient is not COVID nineteen. Oh, he could be, but we don't have the suits and so. <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, during the the pandemic and COVID nineteen, the prone position has been the, the rescue method for many many patients. And uh, in our own ICU, we have treated about around about only thirty COVID patients in Finland. The COVID nineteen has been very calm uh, but uh, we have had some patients and they one or two in ECMO and uh, lots of them in prone position and we have been rehearsing through simulation uh, turning the patient into prone position and that has been a very very good uh, simulation too because you have to remember you have to remember um, certain points and uh, uh, safety points and uh, uh, so to get the the the, uh, the good things about good things out of the prone positioning. Yeah, yeah. And after the after the recommendations that we we got from our attendee, we can see a little bit improving. 
uh, on the vital yeah. vitals here. Yeah. So the heart rate has has increased or decreased uh, around 90. Uh, the saturation is is roughly 90 as well. Uh, no significant uh, changes in blood pressure, and the uh, capnograph is it's about the same, so yeah. five five point two at the at the moment. Yeah, I, I would take now an arterial blood gas sample yeah. and check it out. The vitals, uh, how is the oxygenation? How is the uh, pH? Uh, what has happened to uh, carbon dioxide? How is the patient faring? And uh, and do the airway breathing circulation uh, just uh, evaluation again to see that this is okay. Then I can go to coffee after the treatment of this difficult case. Uh, if we think about, we go a little <coughs> bit back and we think about the planning, the simulations. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about the uh, thorax pictures, for example. Yeah. So would you, which you've been preparing uh, to display some uh, uh, ultrasound pictures for for the participant here or EKG or uh, yeah. what kind what yeah. kind of more information yeah. would yeah. you would you provide? I, I would do that. Um, I know that the Larda simulation system it is able to go and see there, but that's not the normal way. We can't see them yeah. on the monitor. So I would uh, set up an. Uh, uh, laptop computer with these uh, findings because when doctors uh, ask for, for example, for example, thorax X-ray, there becomes the <coughs> radiology department nurses. It takes time. It takes uh, they take the picture and then you go somewhere to see it. So I would uh, make this uh, situation as real as possible. So the doctor goes and then he has to tell the team. What are the findings? So that is also the treatment of the intensive care unit patient is teamwork. Yeah. And one of the main, main uh, objects of our simulation training is uh, enchants the teamwork. Yeah. And I, I think that is very important uh, when we are treating critical ill patients. Uh, talking about realism and immersive. So do you like to take the the real time that goes to that in, in the real situation as well. I mean that that taking an X-ray it, it takes what ten to fifteen minutes at least. So, do you like to use the time as it is in the real life, or make it faster, or well, what's, your, what's your opinion on, on that? Yeah. Well, if you, if we have, um, uh, for example, we don't have radiology department nurses here. So if they want to take an X-ray, we have something that is simulated. Uh, background, for example, a plastic, uh, what it is, the, the nurses need to lift the patient safely. Uh, our beds are not that we can put the cassette under, so they have to lift it and put it under the patient. So they have to do it as a team. They, had to, they have to do it prepare safely because the loss of the tube yeah. in this kind of patient is catastrophic. So that is a very important thing that you, you use, uh, make ICU procedures safely. And then when they have done it safely, the, the doctor gets the picture and uh, can interpret it and uh, tell the results to the team. Yeah. Okay, what, what next? What are the next steps? Well, our patient is feeling quite, quite well. <laughs> so we, we go to the coffee, so yeah. everything. We enter scenario, we, as you can see, this was three step steps. Uh, three ste diff different steps, and <clears throat> you can also uh, drive it on uh, all the time. So you can have the uh, learning discussion or debriefing after the sets, but you can also stop uh, after every step, so-called rapid cycle uh, uh, education. So you can discuss what, what you should do and why did you do like that and what should you do really, and then, then go the forward. Uh, like, like in a way we did now. Yeah. Uh, this kind of simulation that we have been now going through, <clears throat> through pretty well here. Uh, what kind of target group would you recommend it this, and what would be the uh, 
what kind of knowledge do the participant needs to have before taking a part of a simulation like like this as it is like advanced simulation so i i assume this can't be the really first simulation that they are attending or do you disagree on that well when the nurses and doctors they come to work here in the intensive intensive care unit they are treating patients like this yeah so if you are doing um, a simulation uh, in Finland, I don't know how it's in other Nordic countries, but uh, in Finland we try. Usually our educational system is uh, just throw the patient into work, uh, per, the the person into the work. So if we are running this kind of simulation, it is a, a huge uh, step up from that that you have to go and think yourself, what I shall I do and ask the old, the seniors or whatever. So when you can train the residents and the young nurses or fresh nurses with this kind of uh, uh, simulation, uh, they can safely uh, learn and discuss about the problems, not in the middle of the night when they have this kind of patient in their hands. Yeah. That's, that's our, our main object to establish this kind of training and I, I, I think and if, if you have in your own units uh, this kind of training please write into the chat and uh, tell us the ideas what you are doing and, and what you have been training and rehearsing. During the pandemic did you did you have a, have a need of a familiarizing a, a new staff to the ICU? Yes, we did. And yeah. We, did we you had. use simulation uh, for do that or yeah. do you know how, how it was executed? Yeah, we had this uh, prone position uh, turnarounds, and then we had uh, this operating theater nurses getting uh, working in the ICU, and we had some e-learning material which they could use. But uh, um, uh, in Finland, we were prepared for this kind of a pandemic catastrophe, and it didn't come. So we changed back uh, into a normal system, and it has been... Uh, uh, quite enough and we haven't uh, been uh, we haven't needed the extra stuff from the operating theater I, I think only in Helsinki they have had this uh, specialized uh, COVID-19 ICU working in the different place not in here in Kuopio yeah thank you do you have anything to add when it comes to treat treatment of the patient or 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 if, if we look at the topic that we, we were going through, so planning and executing advanced respiratory simulations. Do you have, Kirsimari, anything you want to still add to the audience? Well, uh, I think that uh, running simulation is a, a complete fun. And I think I enjoy every time. Uh, uh, and uh, doing this kind of simulation and, and try, trying to simulate stimulate the participants to think and to uh, learn and maybe sometimes preparing and reading and uh, learning beforehand and afterwards about this yeah i think that's that's the makes my day yeah okay we have still a couple of minutes left so please use the time uh, and uh, and write your comments write your questions to the do the chat so we have have still a couple of minutes to answer those those questions and then while while you guys are doing that uh i think this uh, i know this was the uh, last webinar before summer now mm -hmm. summer is pretty close and and we will obviously continue doing these webinars uh when the fall comes and and uh you can also uh access some some ideas or topics that you you want to you would like to hear and, and we will make it happen then in, in the fall but uh i don't see any any questions here so i think we are ready ready with with our webinar uh today and uh we have a, a flare thank you Kirsimari, that we could we could be here and you could be with us here uh, and we could actually use the use the real environment here and, and make it a little bit more more realistic and maybe even immersive to the to the audience as well so 
this was our webinar today. I want to thank you. Thank you all. And thank you, Gersi Maria, for being with us. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. And I really hope you enjoyed uh, our small talk about this simulation in the intensive care unit. Thank you. And you will get uh, a recording afterwards and you can, you can share it that to your colleagues. So thank you everyone and bye-bye. Bye-bye.